Hello everyone, sorry today we are a bit late, but thank you for being with us. Uh, well, this is our fourth lecture of the Bulletin of Near Eastern Excavations and Research. But if you have missed the previous lectures, you can find them here on YouTube, on the Camness channel. Uh, I am Valentina Santini, as you probably may know if you attended the previous lectures. And I'm going to moderate these and the next encounters. The Balletin of Near Eastern Excavations and Research, as the title suggests, uh, collect lectures concerning the ongoing project and uh, the current archaeological excavations in the Near East. And it is intended both for the scientific and uh, the general public. And in fact, at the end of each lecture, there's a section dedicated to you, to your questions. Uh, therefore, if you have doubts, if you want to ask something concerning the subject of our lecture, you can use the chat which is located next to the video here in the YouTube page. And at the end of the lecture, I'm going to read those questions or those comments uh, to our speakers. The title of today's lecture is The Biography of a Phoenician Cult Place, Karayeb from the Queries to the Ka Museum. And so please let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Ida Ojano, researcher at the ISPC of the National Research Council, CNR, and Wissam Khalil from the Lebanese University. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so I can start sharing the screen. Uh, hello, everybody. I want to thank, uh, first of all, Stefano Valentini, Guido Guarducci, uh, Valentina Santini, of course, for inviting us to participate in this interesting cycle of lesson. Today, our journey through the Near East takes us to Lebanon, a beautiful and troubled country. Its past, its history are rich and fascinating. And today we will try to introduce you to a part of it through the illustration of the Kharayeb archaeological project. By focusing our attention on a part of the Lebanese territory, we will be able to retrace, albeit briefly, a part of the history of this important region of Southern Levant. The Kharayev Archaeological Project, directed by me and my colleague and friend with Sam Khalil, works under the umbrella of Direction Générale des Antiquités du Liban in the area of the municipality of Kharayev, south of the final part of the Litani River, where it, flow, where it flows into the sea. The area is strategic and very important for many reasons. Among these, uh, the Litani River itself, the Nahr Litani, the classical Leontes, is an important water resource in southern Lebanon. The river rises in the fertile Beka Valley, west of Baalbek, and empties into the Mediterranean Sea, north of Tyre. Through the history of the region, the Litani always represented a political and a geographical frontier. The other reason is that Kharayeb is located halfway between the great centers of Tyre and Sidon, cities uh, with a very long history and one of the most famous coastal centers of antiquities. The Kharayeb Archaeological Project is a multidisciplinary program of research organized into different branches, the study of the figurine found in cult place of Kharayeb, the cult place itself, and the quarries, the archaeological service of the Karayeb territory, and the project entitled Where the Litani River Flows, focusing on the study of the coast, shores, and water of both the Karayeb and Adelun municipality. To understand where and how it all began, we need to start from the deposits of National Museum of Beirut, where thousands of fragments of terracotta figurine for the Kharayeb Kram place, cult place were kept. To be precise, 1,700 fragments, 8,700 
142 F, therefore single figurines, datable between 7th and 1st century BC. Here, some images of uh, the big, huge work we have done in the storage of the uh, Beirut Museum. The terracotta figurines discovered by Maurice Shehabe Ibrahim Kaukabani between the 1946 and 1970 uh, was studies, uh, were studies uh, um, in, thanks to the uh, Harayeb archaeological mission. The terracotta figurines, uh, here some images of the team working uh, on the Harayeb project, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Tatiana Pedrazzi and Giuseppe Garbati, uh, Carola Talla of Direction Générale des Antiquités, uh, Mariana Castiglione, she's uh, publishing with me the entire uh, huge quantity of figurines, and the two young scholars, Fabio Porzi and Lorenzo Somma. I want to, um, to to say the name of our uh, colleagues. Uh, the terracotta figurines have been analyzed in order to process qualitative and quantitative data. They were entered in a database and examined in terms of iconographic and stylistic features, as well as technical aspects. The study of the technical aspect of production technique for example, manufacturing technology. Here are some images of the double mold uh, technique used in the Hellenistic period. The figurines were covered with white slip and after with the colors. Uh, the study of technical aspect is now an integral part in the study of ceramic and figurines that are now we know very well the most abundant artifacts of archaeological excavation. The many questions that archaeologists call to address have come to include checking the provenance of artifacts and locating the production centers, or, or at least outlining the likely geographical area of origins. That's why we start a, a very um, important collaboration with the Lebanese Atomic Energy Commission, commission uh, led by Mohamed Rumi here in a uh, picture with me in a conference and uh, using the ion beam analysis technique. Nonetheless, the re examination of this finding could not be forgotten on a museum storage. Clay figurines, either repositioning is their historical, archaeological, and cultural context. On November 2013, the Harayeb archaeological project with at first aimed mainly to reconstruct the life of a Phoenician cult place has been enlarged to become a wider interdisciplinary study of the agricultural interland of Tyre between the second millennium and the Hellenistic period. In fact, the study of the cult place gave us the opportunity to direct our research toward the so-called rural archaeology, considering the landscape as an expression of the communities that contributed to its formation. Studies are no more focused only on the urban center and monumental architecture, as was before, but are oriented to a complex economic system, including the examination of the inland areas and the small rural settlement. However, despite this reorientation of research, the situation of the Phoenician coastal cities in Interland is not still not well known. For example, uh, when the project started, our information about the countryside was limited to Hellenistic period and suggested that the area was poor and isolated at that time. However, new data from the survey in the territory of the municipality of Harayeb has shown that the situation in antiquity must have been very different. The region was, in fact, a reason rich in cultivation and well connected to the coast, which is only a few kilometers away. And now I pass to my colleague with Sam Khalil the, um, to illustrate this part of the project okay. connected to the survey along the coast of the mouth of Litani River. Uh, I will be talking briefly about the results of the of the surveys, archaeological surveys undertaken in uh, under the Haraiba project. So basically, we did all kind of uh, 
uh, archaeological surveys, coastal survey, uh, underwater survey, uh, geoelectrical survey, um, uh, and the territory is not uh, is not easy because we're talking about hills, we're talking about a coast, we're talking about near shore, and we're talking about also the underwater uh, activities. So combining all these uh, these types of survey, all these types of teams, the results were uh, were excellent uh, in a way or another. So basically. Uh, we uh, we under we undertook uh, a near shore uh, survey and coastal survey uh, in the area that you can see on this uh, satellite image stretching from the place the the Litani River up to uh, to a locality a port called Adlun. So we're talking about a large uh, cultivated uh, area with a variation of uh, sea level sedimentation. Uh, different types of plantation so uh, the survey uh, was not that easy and we have results stretching from the uh, fifth fourth century bc up to the uh, ottoman period uh, covering all these periods so um, uh, the methodology is uh, is easy we have to divide the area uh, and since the area is already divided by uh, lots of uh, agricultural parcels agri agri agricultural lots so we gave, we attribute numbers to each of, uh, of these parcels and we tried to survey them. Uh, of course, some of, some of which were not easy or were not accessible, as you can see uh, on the right slide uh, with this X, because it's a private property, was not accessible. Some of which were severely destroyed by bulldozers, so there was no need to, uh, to enter, as you can see on the left with this hashed uh, parcel. So, just to say, just to demonstrate that things as, are not as easy as uh, uh, they seem on the uh, satellite images. So the coastal survey managed to uh, reveal uh, a total uh, number of 26 sites and 44 features. We divided uh, the results of the survey between sites as entity and a feature as a related feature. So when we talk about sites, it could be a house, it could be uh, a road, it could be, um, I mean, a house with features around, it could be the whole road, it could be a tell, it could be a port. Uh, so a site is a combination of uh, several, uh, several features. Um, for example, just to give you a taste of um, what the archaeologist can see, uh, for example, this site, uh, the place called Khirbet Ain al-Anatir, or Khirbet Ain al-Kantara, which is uh, a water uh, installation, as you can see from the Ottoman, renovated during modern times, with all kinds of uh, objects found around or in the near uh, area and put into this site. So this site is, is very particular because it revealed the presence of, uh, later, of, of an archaeological tell. Uh, to the north, uh, near the port of Adun, the place called Minit Buzabil, uh, Minit means the port uh, in the uh, local dialect. Uh, there is this uh, quarry and working areas for salt and fish, uh, as you can see on these uh, three, uh, three photos. Um, also, there are traces of uh, quarrying activity. Uh, the quarrying activity took place on other uh, basin uh, settle, uh, basin uh, features. Uh, the quarrying activity is so intense that it destroyed parts of the, uh, let's say, the fishing, the fish industry, and the salt industry uh, from antiquity and middle and middle times, and middle and middle ages. So the quarrying during the Roman period destroyed what is a little bit earlier, and the quarrying from the Middle Ages destroyed what was left earlier, and the quarrying during the Ottoman period destroyed a little bit of uh, what, uh, what figured earlier. Uh, another site in Adlun, uh, a funeral site stretching from the coast up to the first hills, is a large cemetery, uh, basically from um, a necropolis dating from the Roman period and probably belonging to the people who live in, um, in a place that we cannot exactly found uh, underneath the modern Adlun. So 
the necropolis is very, very visible, but the ancient city or the ancient town is not, um, is not excavated or not located uh, exactly. Um, another type of site, as you can see on the right uh, satellite image, where uh, there is this natural harbor uh, and very interesting to survey. And the survey revealed uh, the presence of an artificial mound and traces of quarries. Um, and also some features uh, visible underneath the water and an amount of uh, ceramic sherds, like you can see on this photo, some of which are dating from the Roman period, from the Hellenistic period, from the Byzantine period, and from the medieval period. Uh, also, uh, since this uh, parts of this coast are rocky, they were exploded by uh, by the ancient inhabitant and uh, as quarries. Why quarries? Because they, the, this kind of sandstone is very easy to cut and very easy to build with. So uh, there was a large demand on using this kind of uh, this kind of uh, this kind of stone. Also, you can notice easily that the level of the sea, or maybe there was some uplifting of the uh, of the uh, of parts of the coast. Uh, and uh, in some places, the uh, level rise of of the water that submerged part of the uh, of these quarries. Uh, also, there is along the Roman uh, road, the Roman medieval and Ottoman road, we can see this beautiful uh, circular uh, well from the probably from the Ottoman period. Uh, very close to, uh, as you can see, on uh, there's this water stream and this beautiful uh, bridge from the Roman period that we will uh, we will highlight in the next few slides. Uh, there are also uh, remains of cisterns, as we can see on uh, on this photo, located very close to the ancient uh, port of Adlun. Uh, a cistern from the Roman period, looted, unfortunately, and uh, inside of which there are shreds of ceramics searching from the Roman, Byzantine, and early Islamic period. Uh, the scoop of, uh, of the survey was the, uh, uh, the discovery of the magnificent discovery of a tell, archaeological tell, on the coast and near the mouth of the Litania River, as you can see on uh, on this, uh, on the on the right satellite image from dating from 2001. So uh, we can distinguish easily on the satellite image in the presence of of the tell. I mean the morphology of uh, of the terrain. We can see uh, this green spot, which is the water uh, place under the name of Herbert Island Anatar that I mentioned earlier. Along this agricultural road leading to the coast, we found this section that uh, uh, we cleaned carefully, and it revealed uh, uh, the remains of uh, a tell from stretching from the um, Iron Age three Hellenistic period. And uh, there are some, uh, inside the tell, some uh, ceramic uh, shreds from, from the Roman period. So basically, the presence of this, uh, the presence mm -hmm. of this site on the mouth of the Litani is very relevant because it, uh, it means that the morphology of the whole coast was different. We, we should not imagine this place as, mm -hmm. uh, as we can see it today. This is the mouse of, um, of the Litani as we can see it today. The Felicotteri that you can see is, a, is not a real one. It's a, it's a, it's a toy. Uh, uh, very beautiful images. Thank you, Ida. Um, and also from the mouth of the Litani, we can see the city of Tyre. So it, Tyre as a city is not very far. So the importance of the site um, uh, along the coast between Tyre, between Adlun and Sarepta is important, meaning that this place was not disconnected from the rest of the uh, main centers of, uh, of the activity. Uh, this uh, satellite image shows the, uh, the place of the Litani River and shows where Tyre is as you can see, this beautiful reconstruction of Tyre during the Phoenician period. So basically, everything is linked. 
uh, all the activities, agricultural activity, fishing activity, uh, trade were linked in a way or another to the uh, coastal and the interland. So this is the importance of these, uh, this study and of, of this survey. So these are uh, photos showing the work under progress uh, in, uh, on this, uh, on this tell. As you can see, the, uh, the mound is not so high, but it is uh, nevertheless uh, important. Uh, the, uh, the, the function, the exact function of the tell is not yet uh, very clear. Probably it could be related to a fishing activity or, a, or some kind of port. We don't know, but uh, several types of uh, ceramics were found among uh, jars, uh, amphoras uh, from uh, different periods. And the important thing also is this, the remains of this wall with the ashlars, with bossaj, very common in the Persian period and even earlier in Byblos, in Ishmun, the beneath uh, photos show the bossaj technique from the fortification or from the fort dating from the Achaemenid period, uh, 5th century BC in, in the city of Biblos, Jbeil. So the presence of a wall built with ashlars, large, with big ashlars from, with the, using the Bussage technique could indicate a construction, a wall, a tower, a temple. We don't know exactly yet. Uh, something to notice uh, through uh, the study that the site the limit of the site ends where the, the wall with ashlars is. So maybe we could assume that, that this wall was or constituted some kind of limit of the site. Also, we have to uh, uh, shed the light on the fact that this site was built on layers of sands. And these layers of sand were built on layers of clay not built, like were accumulated on, on, on layers of clay. So we have to rewrite the history, the geological history of the tell yet to come and soon. Uh, to go back to the Roman period, and this is a 3D uh, model of the Roman bridge, uh, probably from, according to Galeazzo, from the third century uh, AD. Uh, this is a rare example of a Roman uh, structure, uh, road structure, Roman bridge, is still almost uh, usable, and it was in use until the 19th century and the early 20th century by all travelers who, uh, who needed to cross the Abu al-Aswad uh, river. So these are rare photos. This is a rare photo from the 19th century uh, by Duc de Lin, uh, showing the bridge as it was during the uh, late Ottoman period and with a drawing also of, um, of, of the bridge. So we, we, know, we can easily notice that there are layers of accumulation still going on from the 19th century till, till today. These are an, an uh, 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 aerial photo from the 1950s and a satellite image from the, from the year 2001 showing the, uh, the place of, of this bridge. Uh, we can see easily this there is this road continuing through Adlun, but everything is underneath layers and layers of sediment in the part of, of Kharayib. An important work was undertaken by uh, our colleague Nicolas Carayon that we salute, um, studying the coast, the level changing of the coast, the uprising of the coast, the uprising of the, of the sea level, uh, determining the, uh, determining the uh, the coastal uh, uh, floor, uh, for example, from the uh, first millennium uh, AD and the major changes. So uh, a very delicate work, a very scientific work. Um, we also are, we are, 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 we are waiting the results of this C14 dating to, uh, to do some fine tuning of, of, these, um, of these dates. For example, also, uh, Things to be determined that uh, the if, um, the high energy event that could be related, for example, to to earthquakes that are able to mobilize big blocks from one side to another. Not we're not talking about maybe maybe we're talking about a tsunami. Maybe we're talking about uh, an earthquake. Also uh, to be deter uh, to, to be studied furthermore by by Nicola. Um, 
a more uh, elaborated work was done by doing soil coring in several places, since we were talking about uh, accumulation of, of, uh, of clay, accumulation of sands in some places. So we needed to do the sequence of all these accumulation and all these variation uh, uh, with these coring that could go up to um, the uh, 10th millennium uh, BC. So covering all the period and all the variation that occurred during this period. Uh, when we talk about uh, survey, we have to talk about archaeological surveys, and uh, these surveys were funded uh, by the Honor Trust Foundation. And since we're talking about um, this large coastal area, it was important to do the uh, um, the underwater uh, the underwater survey, revealing several places where uh, elements of ceramics were found, and also in other places where there's this uh, uh, the presence of two reefs uh, around which uh, were found uh, important elements dating ceramics uh, amphoras dating from the fifth century BC up to the Byzantine period attesting probably uh, shipwrecks. Uh, all these uh, elements uh, could lead to uh, an intense activity of maritime activity, uh, the link between this maritime activity and these uh, these uh, ports, such as this, the, the Tal Qasmiyye, such as the Abu Zabal Mina uh, in Adlun, the large port, or the, uh, uh, the smaller one, are to all, also to be uh, assessed and, uh, and worked. Uh, let's go to the interland, to uh, to the hills of Kharaib, where um, where the team uh, also discovered or rediscovered a place called Tel Jamjim that was noticed by Ernest Renan, um, and uh, let's to be honest, was uh, maybe first discovered by Alphonse Durigello, uh, who uh, probably before us surveyed the whole side and entire area and announced all all its discoveries to Ernest Renan, who had uh, who published these discoveries in uh, the book published in eight in 1864, mm -hmm. La de and in Tel Jamjim they found this beautiful piece of um, of uh, 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 probably a decoration of a temple showing a priest probably doing some kind of um, uh, burning incense, so also a topic related to worshipping. Uh, this object, this beautiful object, is today in the Louvre, and it reveals uh, the presence of an ancient, also, worship place, someplace in Jemjim. Uh, so we have to distinguish the Jemjim Tel, where the site is, where the site is, is exactly. This is the Mazra Jemjim. This is the Tel Jemjim, and this is the Mazra Jemjim. So the Mazra Jemjim probably reused uh, stones from Jemjim and where we can find uh, also ceramic from the Roman period to the Mamluk medieval and Ottoman period. In Jemjim, we were talking about different period. We we're talking about the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Uh, several uh, pedestrian surveys were undertaken by the uh, Kharayib mission. Uh, several soundings were undertaken by the Kharayib mission. And unfortunately, uh, this site is severely damaged by looters, as you can see in, uh, on these photos. So uh, the team uh, started to do some cleanings of some of the pits made by the looters, uncovering the, this beautiful cistern with, with, this, with the original uh, plaster still uh, intact. So this is a 3D model of this, this unique, if I may say, in, uh, in Lebanon, of this unique uh, structure. Uh, here it's a close-up photo of the of the plaster on 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 the walls of the cistern, and it was full of ceramics dating from the bronze, from the bronze age uh, till uh, the uh, till the Persian period. Uh, we have to uh, give a, a tribute to to the heroes of of these discoveries, to the heroes who worked uh, very hard on the study of the material. I'm talking about. Paco, Paco Nunez, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about Barbara Mura, I'm talking about Tatiana Pedrazzi, 
who did excellent work, uh, very hard work, a lot of materials to study. Uh, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of ceramic shells. Uh, also a big thanks to Ida. Um, just, just to say, this is the, the, the conditions of work were not that easy. We were limited in time and we had to uh, bring too much, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, results. This is also probably uh, an agricultural productive area, maybe for uh, working the grapes. Um, and uh, before uh, ending uh, the pedestrian survey and the survey, uh, and since during the beginning, I mentioned that uh, the Harayib mission undertook all kinds of survey, and the end is to the uh, geophysical or geoelectrical survey, electrical sensitivity tomography, uh, revealing uh, the importance and the extent of this inhabited area on Tel Jemjim that is yet to be uh, to be studied, excavated, or maybe sounded. So um, I would like to thank you and give uh, uh, give the floor to uh, to Ida to um, to continue this uh, this presentation. Ida. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you please turn your microphone on? C can you can you hear me, Ida? Okay. Um, the the icon with the microphone in the uh, bottom part on the left. There's an icon uh, which should say something like attiva l'audio or uh, turn on uh, the microphone. It depends on the, the language. <laughs> because we, we can't okay, see, okay, uh, great. Now, we we okay. can hear you, thank you. Uh, no, thank you, thank you, sorry. And um, I just want to, okay. Tell me if it's okay now. Yes. Um, yes, it is okay. okay. Thank you. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. After talking about the serving work on the territory of the mouth of the Litani River and the phases uh, between the second millennium and the Persian period, let's now talk about the cult place of Kharayeb. From this place come the best known finds of the area, the beautiful terracotta figurines we have talked about earlier. Here you can see the beautiful reconstruction and I'm very uh, grateful for, to um, Giuseppe Carzetta who gave me this uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, gift. After the discovery of several figurines in the area, the director of the Lebanon Antiquities, Mir Shahab, started to excavate the, uh, the ruins of a rectangular building dating from the Hellenistic period. Near this building, a favista rich in figurines dating from between the 6th and the 1st century was found. Afavis is a place uh, underground, reservoir, near the temple. Uh, this is for students, uh, for sacred utensil no longer in use. After this uh, work, uh, there are the works of Kaukabeni in the 1969 and our work on the site that started in 2013. To illustrate now how I arrived to the reconstruction of the original aspect of the temple that is unusual for the Phoenician uh, temple period, um, and uh, uh, starting from data scattered between the old publication and new excavation, I will use the well-known metaphor of archaeolog archaeologists as a detective. First, I collected evidence of a crime scene. This evidence test are as follow, an Egyptian gorge type cornice, a lintel, an altar, some statues of a different dimension, fragment of plaster and uh, an inscription, sorry, fragment of a plaster, gemme, 
uh, gems uh, of plano convex gems and uh, mosaic tessere. And then now, with these few elements collected, interpreted, and dated, let's try to reconstruct the different phases of life of the cult place and the rites performed in it. It is well known from a tradition, sorry, from a tradition of studies that use sociology and anthropology in the historical interpretation of the archaeological data that every object has a personal history. For the reason, I will illustrate the history of this cult place as if it were the history of the different phases of a personal life, birth, life, in its different moment and with its big and small changes, and finally its hand. This presentation also aims to demonstrate, in particular, to the student how even in the absence of monumental remain, it is possible through a precise study of the data to reconstruct the original appearance of a cult place and the rite performed in it. The first phase uh, is, uh, um, can be dated to the 9th century because the earliest pottery is dated to this period. The form and extent of the structure connected to the first phase are unknown because they were probably made of a perishable material, perhaps hood. Here, some traces of the post hole, probably. Thanks to the comparison of the so-called <laughs> circumstantial evidence with material from the site of Amrit and Tel Burak can be attributed to these chronological phases, the feet of the statue, a small statue and a small altar. Which ritual here in images of Amrit uh, that I uh, took as a, a comparison for comparison of the materials? Which rituals were practiced in the cult place from these phases? Together with the figurines, small and the miniature vases, plates and bowls, serially produced, were dedicated, used probably uh, as container for a very small amount of grain or other food, uh, also a wool um, or a lock of her or in some cases, a liquid offering, for instance, wine, oil, or water. This reconstruction is important because ritual practices in Phoenician religious content are almost unknown, apart from the big uh, statues or some very precious object. Uh, in particular, the ritual performed with pottery are practically unknown. In a phase that can perhaps be dated the beginning of Hellenistic period, the structure of the Iron Age to Persian period were obliterated by a larger and completely different building. The edifice was built using blocks extracted for an extended area of quarries located on a calcareous part very close to the building. And it's very important because it's not so frequent to find the quarries and the building very close to each other. The square building, here are another images of the, the quarries, the square building has its southern side opening onto a pile courtyard and a rectangular room form the west and northwest part of the edifice. From a picture published by Maurice Schaab, we can deduce that the walls, now preserved only at the level of the foundation, were built using a technique typical of the Persian Hellenistic period in the Levant. In this phase, the wall were covered both inside and outside with a plaster, another of the circumstantial evidence that we have used. The external part of the building was decorated with architectonic elements that very typical of sacred building in the area of Tyre. An Egyptian gorge type cornice ran beneath the flat roof of the building and a lintel with the traces of red color, probably from the main entrance to the building, was decorated with a sun disk flanked by a ray. The reconstruction represented here, thanks to Marquarizza, is based on a very close comparison with the sanctuary of Umelamed built between the end of the 4th and the 3rd century BC. Two statues 
statues were unearthed by Kaukaban in front of the square building. You only see these old photos by Kaukabani because the statues were lost during the war of the 70-80 of the last century in Lebanon. They were supported by a door are pillared and wear a short, plain Egyptian style kilt with a plain belt. The two statues can be placed chronologically between the 4th and the 7th century. Indeed, they belong to a group of sculptures inspired by the Egyptian iconography tradition, representing a male figure with advanced leg wearing a shendit and with an emblematic stave in the left hand or carrying an animal under the left uh, arm. Where uh, were they positioned? I propose immediately outside the square rectangular building on the basis of the Harayeb indication and by the comparison again with Um El Ahmed, where a statue base with inscription has been found in situ on the right hand side of the doorway in the Western sacred area. Even the statue and description are well rooted in the oriental tradition, objects used in ritual from pottery to figurines are inspired by the contact with the Greek word. A ritual seems oriented to the action of pouring oil, unguentaria, and the libation with a jug of a small and medium size. And then now the last phase, Hellenistic phase two. Once again, they are very small clues that allow us to propose a further phase of the building life. A group of tesserae of various colors indicate the existence of a simple opus tessellatum with a geometric motif. It is likely that a stucco decoration was applied to the wall, which may have been similar to that of the rich houses of the coastal cities in this period. We have a lot of excavation in Tire, but also Beirut, and it was probably associated with the decoration with ovuli. And now, uh, some observation, consideration about the ritual practices from the moment of his birth to the end and the use of the sanctuary, we can be placed on the basis of the last figurine from the Fadissa at the first century. At Harayeb, the majority of material used in ritual from ceramic to figurines is small in size, such that it can, uh, that, um, it can be held in the palm of an hand. The scale adopted appear to be fundamental and the tactic element together with specific bodily movement takes on an important role along with the visual and the perhaps olfactory aspect. We know from a lot of study in the miniature materials, the dimension plays a fundamental role in the production of any job object in the relationship that the people established on both a visual and a tactile level with it. It is difficult for us to access the Harayeb community's way of thinking about the scale and the miniaturization. What we can say is that in a context on the border between rural and urban communities, those who went to the cult plays created through the use of a character, anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figurines and the vessels, a kind of sacred representation of a miniature world that is somewhat reminiscent of a crash. Something similar is found in the figurines of Neapolitan nativity scene, where the images of ordinary people, as in Harayeb, are part of a sacred representation. The history of the cult place is not finished yet. A project of an archaeological park with a museum project, uh, uh, the project is, is uh, of uh, Richard Jean, is opening a new phase in the life of a cult place. And thanks to the collaboration with the local authority, a never ending story for the future of the life of the heritage of this region. Uh, I want to speak in the present, using present, because I want to think that Lebanon has a future. The museum is organized like a forest of columns and with a good using of light and the voices, the terracotta statuette should talk and narrate their story to those who participate to the visit. We have reached the uh, last part of our project, which sees the involvement of local community in the announcement of its cultural heritage. We must remember that the first problem to deal Sorry, but okay. 
um, uh, to deal is uh, the attitude toward the so-called atharat, the antiquities. The antiquities are not perceived as a concrete need, not as an heritage of the community. The intervention in the apparently marginal agricultural territory, if compared to the other coastal urban areas like Sidon or Tyre or Beirut, would be an example of the centralization policy, which would include the agricultural area, the earth of Lebanon's territory, and the cultural development in order not to, to relegate it as just the food sources. Therefore, the museum might be added into a wider net adding value to artisanal tradition, like, for example, the um, the, uh, as it happened in Sidon, where there is this, the wonderful, beautiful Sidon Soap Museum, or making glass in the traditional way, uh, like in Sarepta, where this ancient tradition is now uh, reused and uh, um, you can find also little shops and so on. So, touristic cultural uh, perspective, but, but thinking to the last, uh, the situation of Lebanon today, in particular after the blast of the 4th August, one might think how it is possible to consider the planning of such innovative activities. Why planning in a country which is always associated with the symbol of instability, for example, the answer is because of planning in a critical areas do, and it significantly contributes to the strengthening of a social and for political balances. The project of the archaeological park is still far away for bring concretely realizes two main goals. On the one hand, the preservation and valorization of archaeological good, and on the other, the contribution that he may give to the social and economical development of the light condition of the local community, which are fundamental to guarantee stability to the country through the development of both economic and the cultural internal growth activity. This is our final message of hope with the images of the lesson and the participation of students of the University of Saida to our activity in the project. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both of you because of these uh, wonderful and very fascinating um, lecture. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, so as I mentioned in the very beginning of this lecture, the final part uh, is dedicated to the questions of our audience. Unfortunately, for the moment, we don't have questions. And I would like to um, encourage you, uh, of course, if you have uh, questions, if you have comments uh, concerning this subject, you can uh, write your comments in the chat here in the YouTube page. And in the meantime, I would like to ask you something um, concerning the, the final part of the presentation. Um, I was wondering um, how um, how different was your perception of the past of Karayeb um, before the mutual uh, exchange of ideas and points of views uh, you mentioned in the, in the final part of the lecture? Was it different, your, your perception? Uh, between the when we started the project and the final part of the project yeah yeah uh, yeah um, yes of course because we try to involve the the, the people of the village of Karayeb in uh, uh, the activities we lived uh, in the in the village um, we can live in Tyre, for example, but uh, we stay inside the village and uh, we we have now a lot of good friends. But the problem is that uh, um, we have to involve, uh, to, to let uh, them understand that uh, is a very 
important the valorization of the heritage, um, not only from a cultural and a theoretical and abstract point of view, but also practically, because you know, in a place where um, often they live in a critical situation with uh, <laughs> it's not so easy to it, it's not it's not easy in Italy and so can you imagine how difficult it is in a place uh, overwhelmed by problems of all uh, kind but we were we are now everything is stopped that's why i said after the blast of the 4th of august and the covid and all the problems of the, this poor uh, country uh, we reached a good a very good interaction with municipality uh, and uh, also thanks to the Direction General des Antiquités du Liban, uh, the director and uh, Miriam Ziad, we are trying to uh, to create a very strong collaboration. So something was changing, now, now everything is stopped unfortunately. Yes, of course. I don't know if, if we somehow want to say something from the Lebanese perspective. Well, well yes, I, I would like to add that if, even that this period is a little bit difficult, but I just thinking about the future, I think we have to pursue this collaboration because this project is, um, is seen by the scientific committee as um, bringing every year something new, but we have to think also from the perspective of the people of Kharaib and the surrounding area that they, especially the people from Kharaib, every year they are waiting for this mission, uh, for the collaboration, for the uh, opportunities, the ideas. So it became something uh, as part of the, uh, of the life of, uh, of the village. Let's put aside the uh, awareness, let's put aside the projects, let's put aside the collaboration, uh, economical op opportunities. It became something, there's a bond, human bond uh, between uh, the team members and the uh, municipality of Harayev. So everyone is, is, is waiting until this, uh, this bad chapter of, uh, of the history of humanity, the year 2020 to end, so we can pursue on both sides, the, the scientific uh, research and also uh, this beautiful bond between local authorities and also between uh, between the uh, the lovely people of Kharaib. Yeah, thank you. I, I can imagine the, the difficulties, but I um, I really love your point of view to consider the future. I mean, we have to think. Uh, about the present, of course, but uh, to the future as well. So unfortunately, we don't have questions uh, from <laughs> our public, uh, but I really would like to thank you again uh, for your lecture. It was uh, really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to you. <laughs> and I would like also to thank uh, you for joining us. Um, next lecture will be next week, uh, December the 2nd, so next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Italy time as usual. Uh, Luca Peyronel will discuss uh, the development of a complex societies in northern Mesopotamia during the late Chalcolithic period, a view from the Erbil plan. So thank you so much for joining us today and see you next week. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valentina.